Okay, so the most important thing, I mean, why we are, of course, moving towards a, a precision medicine landscape is the fact that we actually have more and more targeted agents available in the clinic. So it's of utmost importance, of course, that you really know the molecular architecture of your tumor before actually you start any of these therapies. So I think the textbook example here, and actually the first class of molecules where we actually have this data are the, the PARP inhibitors, of course. So since the, the, I mean, introduction of PARP inhibitors, it has become mandated, of course, that we actually screen our patients or actually profile our patients, whether or not they actually um, have or carry DNA repair defects within their tumor. Um, and, and not solely in the tumor, of course, also assessing whether or not these events are present in the germline are of um, utmost importance. So you actually have this three level um, of reasons why we actually need to do uh, this type of molecular profiling. It's not only solely for the prediction, um, of, of the therapeutic efficacy, uh, because we have learned, of course, that it's primarily the BRCA altered um, um, cases that uh, derive the biggest benefit from a PARP inhibitor, but also from a prognostic perspective. So, um, for instance, at the capture study from David Olmos, we actually have learned that indeed um, patients with BRCA altered disease overall have actually a shorter um, or an, a more inferior prognosis to compare to non HRR altered tumors. So, that's also the second reason. Uh, third reason, of course, if you then have actually profiled now um, the statuses of these genes, uh, um, primarily in the in the German, it's also important for potential future genetic consults um, of these patients because it's not only the the particular patient in this case that actually um, has benefit from knowing this information, but also his progeny, of course, um, his or um, her children would also have to run by a genetic consult um, to get more insight um, into this um, into this genotype. Of course, nowadays um, when it comes to the actual testing, um, two avenues can be actually be walked. One is the the, the more classical um, um, tissue based uh, analysis. We're typically using a, a a biopsy either from the primary or a metastatic site is being subjected to molecular characterization or molecular analysis. Nowadays, we are steadily also moving towards the use of a liquid biopsy. Now, typically, this is a blood based liquid biopsy where we actually will be uh, working with the plasma because we have learned within the plasma you have these free, um, free floating. DNA molecules typically referred to as cell-free DNA that you can also subject to the same type of analysis. Now, the reality is that it comes with several limitations uh, when working with a liquid biopsy. Um, the fact is that there is only a small fraction within this cell-free DNA that is actually tumor-derived. This is commonly referred to as the circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and this circulating tumor DNA is unfortunately not detectable in all patients with the current technology that we have available. Most likely there will be ctDNA in all patients, but there is this technological constraints where our assays today, the ones that are both commercially available, but also the ones that are in-house made, um, lab developed tests are um, actually lacking the sensitivity to detect ctDNA fraction in all. In our study, in the ProBio study, we have for instance learned that in patients with metastatic resistant prostate cancer that around 30 to 35 percent of the men at probio screening have undetectable levels of circulating tumor dna so this is of course a first limitation um, the way to um, of course tackle this first limitation uh, is by steadily moving from broad uh, comprehensive genomic profiling to rather maybe go focused and then deep uh, profiling. So where, where we typically have a, a broad uh, approach where we are sequencing um, around uh, 1500X, maybe it's more worthwhile to really focus on the targets that you really want to identify and then sequence these targets ultra deep um, using amongst other uh, tools like digital error um, suppression and so on. Um, so it's rather there from the technological development that hopefully will overcome this first limitation. Um, a second limitation when you are working um, with, with liquid biopsies as such is that Let's say if you then have the population where you actually have detected uh, the circulating tumor DNA, then it's actually important to know that the level of the cir circulating tumor DNA will dictate which type of genomic alterations that you are capable of finding. So it all differs because if you are focusing on, on single nucleotide variants, the typical point mutations, or you want to detect uh, copy number alterations, or you want to detect structural variations, they all have different sensitivity thresholds. And it's all being 
dictated by the level of the circulating tumor DNA. When the circulating tumor DNA is very high, let's say above 10%, then typically RSA is capable of detecting all types of genomic alterations. You will actually see them um, um, as clear as the sun. However, once the ctDNA fraction tends to become lower, like in the ballpark of 2% or lower than 2%, then of course you are losing that sensitivity to pick up copy number alterations and still have a preserved sensitivity to pick up single point uh, single point mutations. And this is, of course, very um, important, especially in the context of PARP inhibitors, because we have learned that it's actually the homozygously deleted uh, BRCA-altered cancers that benefit or derive the highest benefit from a uh, treatment with a PARP inhibitor. However, detecting homozygous deletions, uh, this is a, a copy number al alteration where both alleles have been uh, deleted out of the tumor, um, that, of course, comes with the consequence that if your ctDNA fraction is not high enough, you will be on, you will not be able to actually see this particular event. So you might misclassify your patients as being um, homozygously or, or HRR uh, proficient, where they actually might be deficient. Uh, a third limitation of working with uh, liquid biopsies as such is that once you are now in the in the very low ballpark of, of variants that you are picking up in the plasma with very low variant allele frequencies, it becomes very hard to distinguish those events from being truly somatic versus the ones that might potentially be derived from clonal hematopoiesis of intermediate potential. So this is a process where within the, within the blood, you get these clonal expansions within the white blood cell populations that can also acquire mutations that might seem uh, for an untrained eye to be uh, tumor derived, that these are somatic, but they are actually derived from a, um, a white blood cell subpopulation. The way to overcome this limitation is that people need to move away from plasma only sequencing and actually always need to do tumor normal control sequencing, where besides the plasma, so besides sequencing the cell free DNA from the plasma, we are also sequencing the germline DNA from the Buffy coat or from a what white blood cell sample. We're subjecting both of those DNA analytes to the same methodology, the same assay sequencing till the same depth, and then you are in a position that you can really distinguish when you are seeing these low variant allele frequency events, whether or not they are somatic or whether they might be chip derived or not. So these, I think, in our, are in a nutshell the three limitations of working with a liquid biopsy.